How's it going, legends? Welcome back to The Average Garage. In today's episode, we're talking about the Pajero Sport and the five most common failures or issues that you will have with your Pajero Sport. So without further ado, let's dive straight into it. So first up, we've got the intercooler hoses. Now this is a common problem for all modern turbo diesel cars. Um, yeah, it is just oil plus boost pressure plus soft rubber hoses. There's a hole there. Yeah, all of these things play a part. So they just become weak and they will split over time with high boost pressures, etc. Um, even And high boost pressure is stock boost pressure. So it's just a problem that they have. Um, the best way you can remedy this is by fitting aftermarket hoses or hard lines. I only recommend hard lines though if your boost pipes are longer than two feet long. So I'm talking like the, I think the V6 Amarok and stuff like that. Because the Pajero Sport, honestly, it's not worth putting hard lines on. Because the intercooler hoses are just too short. So there's really no point in putting hard pipes on it because you're just creating twice the amount of points for leakage and you're not going to gain any, like you, there's no benefits to it. These flies are friendly today. I've got on my personal car, I have a set of off-road daily hoses. A lot of people have four front industry hoses. That's just the easiest way to fix that issue. But we've also got the big failure of the electronic park brake. Now, possibly one of the worst ideas Mitsubishi had was putting the electronic park brake in that Pajero Sport. Um, they are renowned for failing, especially if you've gone through mud. Uh, they not only get stuck on, but they will put themselves out of adjustment. And once they go out of adjustment, they'll throw a code. Once the code is thrown, I'll see if I can put a picture up on the screen now, if I can get one. But yeah, if the code's thrown, you have to pretty much visit Mitsubishi or somebody with a high-end scan tool that can reset the parameters. And yeah, most of the time from what I've been seeing throughout the forums and stuff and the Facebook pages is that Mitsubishi usually say, oh, the, the brake pads are worn, or sorry, the, um, the handbrake shoes are worn, so we're going to need to replace them. Some dealerships are replacing the whole lot warranty-wise, but a lot of them are trying to charge customers for, which I think is wrong. But uh, yeah, it is a very piss-poor design. The old mechanical yank-it-up handbrake works just fine, apart from Toyota owners, they know all about that. But uh, yeah, it's a design that's been around for donkeys, and... It should have just remained, but they've gone electronic and I reckon that was a fatal mistake. Right, another failure that I have personally experienced, which if you go back on the channel you'll see, is a bash plate mount being broken off. Now, these things have notoriously weak bash plate mounts. It's an ongoing issue, but I've remedied mine by welding some stronger ones on. It is a very common issue. It can, ha it can happen with stock bash plates, although it is more likely to happen with heavier bash plates, e.g. booze or customs or bush skins or whatever the hell. It happens. It is a very common issue. It is a easy enough issue to rectify. I did it myself, but I have experience in some of these things. Um, yeah, I'm definitely no expert, but I do have a little bit of experience. But most workshops can fix this. Most workshops will be able to fix it in-house. You can buy replacement mounts. Um, I think booze sell them and probably custom as well. Either way, they're super simple to make. I made my own from scratch in the shed with my welder. Very basic MIG technique, and I was able to fix mine. Sorry to interrupt folks, but I thought I'd let you know that I'm currently giving away a set of Lightfox 9-inch LED laser spotties. Super simple to enter, jump on the channel, find the giveaway video, drop a comment on that video. The video will tell you exactly how to enter. And yeah, it's free to enter, super easy, takes two seconds. Really appreciate your support. And uh, yeah, let's jump back into the main video. Right, so let's move on to, um, one would say the elephant in the room but I've never personally had this apart from the time I pushed the car well beyond its limits. But a lot of people suffer from overheating. Now, a lot of people will blame this on bull bars and winches and all the front end accessories. One, not only weighing it down, but two, blocking the airflow to the radiator. Now, I've personally never had this, but I don't tow a hell of a lot. And I know a lot of people like to tow heavy vans around. I think towing anything more than two ton is absolutely stupid in this car, but hey, that's just me. So, the only time I've ever had this car hot was I was trying a sand dune hill climb probably about eight times in a row without letting the car cool down. And that's me. That was me being an absolute idiot. I wasn't paying attention to what I was doing. I was too caught up in the moment. And uh, problem being is that those temp gauges don't move until you hit 120 degrees Celsius, by which time you're already causing damage.
you're already doing damage at that point. Um, if you're quick enough on it, you'll get away with it. And if you take the precautions, like I stopped, let the car cool right down before I continued, had the bonnet up, just, yeah, left it idling, let the air, uh, point it into the wind, let the air cool it down as well. Um, but yeah, you take the precautions and you'll be okay, but it is definitely something to keep an eye on, especially if you have more weight on your car and you're pushing it to its limits. So I was pushing it through soft sand, like I said, and about eight, sh eight shots up this hill at one time. And uh, yeah, I didn't let it cool between and it did get hot. Personally, I think the radiator and the cooling system in these things is just way too small. Yes, blocking the airflow is a big thing, but I reckon a radiator upgrade is the way to go. I know Red Devil make a radiator, and I'm pretty sure Mick at offroaddaily.com is also making some new radiators. But yeah, I think the radiator is very small. It's very thin. It's like 16 mil core or something. It is ridiculously small. All right, let's get on to the fifth and final item for this episode. I'll try and keep this episode a little bit short. Um, it is rear sway bar bushes or the rear sway bar link bushes. Now, mine are not too bad, but I know a lot of people, I see it all the time posted on the pages, and they're like, ah, oh, my bushes are screwed. And look, it's not that bad, man. Like, yes, they will destroy themselves and deform, and some people have lost them altogether. Yes, Mitsubishi should replace them under warranty, but they're only gonna do it again. So you, if you're really upset about it, what you really need to do is grab yourself some aftermarket bushes from like Super Pro or something, or I personally stay away from Nolithane, um, but Super Pro or a like an aftermarket rubber option would be your best bet. However, I think, personally, I think the problem is those sway bar links aren't long enough. I think they're too short for the application, so they're always pulled on a dicky angle. I think if you're able to put that, uh, make some longer sway bar links i think you'll be laughing and they'll probably last a hell of a lot longer um yeah but that's just my two cents and that's what i think that problem is i'll show you mine really quickly but uh yeah like i said mine aren't too bad so you can see the top of the lower two bushes is a bit mushroomed out and it's a bit squished now, most people have these where they're pretty much hanging out one side and one side is completely squished. Like I said, mine's not too bad, but I've seen hell of a lot worse than that. Just walked around to the other side of the car and there you have it. That bush is squished. See how it's all squished out the side there? Now look, it's not a huge drama. The worst case scenario is it will start knocking and you'll get a bit of a noise when you go up and down bumps. So in short, yes, you should fix it or you should at least take it to Mitzi and get them to fix it under warranty. Um, it is an issue, but yeah, like I said, the worst case scenario is the car will handle a little bit funny, uh, mainly around turns, it'll sort of sway a bit and then stop. Um, and yeah, you'll feel the car sort of catch itself as well as you might get a slight knocking over bumps. But anyways, guys, that's the top five most common failures of the Mitsubishi Pajero Sport. Hope you've enjoyed it. Please drop in the comments below if I've missed anything or if you think there's another failure that should be higher up on the list. As a bit of a bonus, I don't think there's any DPF issues with these. If there are, I have not heard of many, mainly sensor three failing and split intercooler hoses. Um, but the sensor three failing is pretty uncommon on these. Apparently, it's more a Triton thing. So yeah, um, let me know your experience. Thank you very much for watching. Please don't forget to drop a like on the video if you've enjoyed it and if you like the content. And please, if you find yourself sticking around, hit that subscribe button. It helps me out greatly. I'm trying to hit uh, 10K by the end of 2022. Hopefully it's an achievable goal, but we'll see how we go. So thank you very much for watching. We'll see you all in the next episode. And uh, yeah, peace out guys.